We have Crosses and Jackson. Um, we're uh, looking for more team members there. So if you know anyone, let us know. Uh, but we've been excited to work in these three markets. And what we find is that they have a lot in common. Um, they draw a particular, you know, sort of person. There's a reason why, you know, everybody loves this place. And I think for us, we think about, you know, um, what can we do to participate in perpetuating what's really great about the Rocky Mountain West and how can our practice support those kinds of choices. Um, we're all here for similar reasons in a lot of ways, um, diverse reasons, but, you know, when we're building, are we loving this place to death and are the buildings part of the problem? So, you know, Jackson itself, Wilson, where this project is that we want to share with you is a really unique place. Um, not only is the, you know, the, the cost of development there really high comparative to the rest of the, you know, surrounding region, um, they've got all these forces that are driving on that. It's not just tourism and the national park system, it's outdoor sports, uh, it's retirement communities, it is being landlocked, being surrounded by conservation that is going to say this is only as far as you're going to go. And all that drives up um, development cost. And so what you end up with is, you know, uh, projects that are uh, oftentimes uh, really, you know, either higher end luxury scale, which is, you know, really great and fun, but also, you know, made us question, okay, if we have the ability to approach this market, what do we know about design that would help us make the best building we can if the resources were there? Um, and so we built upon projects that we have already done. And this, this project here is one in Bozeman. It's our uh, second passive house, first one in Bozeman. And it's a very, you know, um, practical design, but one where we were able to really test these five principles of passive house. And for those of you that might be new to passive house systems, we've talked about it more in depth, I think, in previous webinars. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But these five items here are um, really the, the main points of it, where we pay attention to solar orientation. We work through all of our assemblies, the floors, the, the, floors, the walls, the roof, to gain the thermal mass and the insulation value that we need. Uh, we install high-performance windows. Um, in climate zone six and seven, where we are, there is a small part of the market that actually has a certified window through the Passive House Institute. Uh, so we're really hoping to expand the market for um, manufacturers that we can source for those products. Uh, we work hard on airtight enclosure, and then uh, we balance the ventilation with heat recovery. And so you're getting constant fresh air, you're getting maximum thermal comfort. And then we, in design, we have early design tools. This bottom right image here is an output of that project. And it helped us figure out, okay, where do we need to be to hit pass off certification? And this being our first certified project in Bozeman, it's really hard to get that um, actual, you know, specific heat demand, that red area you see down there, to at that threshold that we could. Um, and we've learned some things since then that give us a little bit more comfort about being a bit beyond that threshold. But that's basically the target and what the model helps us find. It might be a little hard to see, but the column on the left represents the losses that are modeled and the column on the right that's like the blue or the red, yellow, and uh, pink is the, the gains from glazing, mechanical systems, things like that. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's something that people often don't understand. Like our typical code buildings are built to really leak and uh, allow the building to ventilate naturally, right? This is how, this is always how log cabins work. Um, and you could, you know, have the you know, particulates inside a wood cabin that would be normal there. And it, it was fine. It actually didn't create that much of a problem. But here we have a super airtight enclosure. So that means we're able to harvest the heat from our cooktop and our bodies and our lighting system and not only just the windows and the sun. So there is passive solar gain, but there's a lot of gains that are basically, uh, you know, unidentified assets within your home that those passive houses designed to give you the benefit of. And then, you know, in general, our, in, within our organization, we are very aware of um, emissions for our, our projects, and we're trying to get better at this. So we're not representing that we're experts on this right now. We're representing that we're trying really hard to have actual data to look at our projects and make better choices. And when we work in a place like this particular lot, we know that the standards must be high. And with an awareness, this is from Architecture 2030, if you're in the architectural practice, you've probably seen it, um, where we know that, you know, building materials make up a gigantic portion of carbon offsets that occur 
um, in our atmosphere. And that is something that we actually have direct impact on. Uh, we can help to make all of our projects make choices where we can reduce carbon footprint. So back around to this place where we're going to design. Uh, we have a really special site in Wilson, Wyoming. Uh, we have really nice direct views of the Teton Range. We are somewhat adjacent to a body of water. Um, and we're in a spot where this view shed is not going to be disrupted. It's in conservation easement. So when you're building in a place that feels very temperate and special and like your backyard is a national park, um, the threshold for what you do, I think, becomes a lot higher. And so uh, this particular owner um, has been always been really fantastic and gracious about pushing us to say, what is possible? What do you know how to do? And how can we do it in the most sensitive way we can to the landscape? So there's a couple of metrics that we look at to, to think about what that really means to us. Um, this graph is from the Living Futures Institute. And, um, you know, through the, through most of our colleagues in the past bus space, we all understand that, that building to code is really a minimum. Um, and that we know much better ways to build for quality, durability, longevity, resiliency, um, and ultimately cost savings. And so uh, clearly living building challenge is a high, high goal to meet. And it is especially, full living building challenge is especially high to meet in a place where water freezes. And so we're hoping to be part of more of those projects in the future, but we realize that there's a combination um, that we could use a, a passive house certified design and that that basically fits into their energy pedal of living building uh, institute living building challenge and so we're hoping that we can meet not only um, a low carbon building with the living futures institute but also the low energy building with the passive house institute but uh, we realize uh, pretty quickly but also along the way continually uh, that we've signed up for a really, really challenging um, goal here. And it not only means that the goals are challenging for all these different reasons, but it means that this project, uh, not only through, um, through design with our consultant team and conversations with our client, but even in discussions with, you know, the contractors, our resulting contractors, and the town and county of Teton uh, town County, that everybody needed to be educated on exactly how to do this and how it could be done. Um, it hasn't been done before in this time zone. So we're dealing with everything from our typical freeze and thaw cycles in Montana to heavy seismic loads. Um, the joke in place and that the views are always to the north. We, uh, the program of this building was to provide for sort of shop and garage and storage um, for the owner. Um, and then a thousand square foot accessory residential unit. And so that's the maximum that can be built in Teton County. And that's important because in passive house design, the air volume that you is, is a critical part of the calculus to get to the delivery that, that um, works best. So the smaller the building, it's actually much more challenging to reach that threshold. Um, and this is why passive house ends up being great for family and, and larger scale buildings, but that's a different presentation. Um, and then on top of it, we've got shop space. So that means we've got, we have to have leaky overhead doors. We've got, you know, important things to think about for air quality. If you're, if you're um, running an engine at all, right? Like that really has to be seriously considered what happens. Um, and then across the board with our systems, we've had um, a role to play as educators for our workforce, for the inspectors, for all the stakeholders that are going to help us make the project real. So along the way, you know, there's certain things that we've had to remind ourselves all along the way. And uh, it was helpful to think about it this way and have a sense of humor about it, but we do have to be ready to educate. Um, we do have to embrace tape, insulation, and expensive windows. This is about the materials and the methods. Um, we shall not thermal bridge. Right? We shall not create a situation where something continuously going from the inside of the thermal envelope to the outside of the thermal envelope, introducing condensation, potential mold, and uh, the deleterious uh, air quality. Um, we shall optimize the orientation of the sun. We got to embrace spreadsheet data and excessive documentation. We have to be ready to capture documentation after the project is will be our baby for a while. Um, and 
tell everybody, thou shalt not tell engineers. Nobody likes to tell that. You shall not the contractor's name in vain. We have to have a fantastic relationship with our contractors. There's just too much to share and too much we have to decide on together for us to um, not be on the same team. And so this is where authentic collaboration for past plus projects will really in. Uh, we have to communicate clearly to all the trades and we have to listen to our clients and their needs and their understanding of what we're doing um, and not just communicating. If I could just jump in real quick and ask that if anybody is not muted themselves, will you please do so? I'm getting some background noise and I can't find out where it's coming from. Thanks. All right. Um, so the next, we really started to sit down to arrange what are the products that we want to use? What are the systems we want to use? They're going to get us to this goal of low carbon. High um, we know certain things about different materials and clearly, uh, we know which materials we're going to choose to, that are going to help us get toward that goal. Um, generally as a company, we've tried to eliminate or just mitigate any use of blue board or spray foam in our projects. And I think that, you know, maybe controversial with some. Um, for us, it's the right choice. And and sometimes, you know, there are situations, especially in renovation, when it seems like spray foam is the answer. But um, when we think about the long-term health of our inhabitants and the great, you know, products that we can use as an, as an alternative that don't break the budget, we just feel like it's a better option. So this graph, uh, hoping to spend, you know, a little bit of time on, or at least, at least have it up long enough that you guys can read it. Um, when we get into life cycle analysis, which is how we understand the carbon footprint of our project, uh, we, everybody's got to understand that um, our information is just based on the da data that we source and how we put it together. So we've got a couple of tools that will help us tabulate different assemblies. And so what you're looking at here is at the very top, a pretty typical two by six stud wall. These are all basic wall assemblies. Um, with uh, closed cell spray foam and it's a uh, carbon footprint for that particular unit of wall assembly and then comparing to insulated concrete forms um, which is ends up being the, the highest level there uh, next uh, down the line was a 12 inch sip with EPS on the outside and this is what we did for our first house in Bozeman it was a lower footprint option but it was the option also that uh, the client could afford and that fit the budget and made the project a reality. So with that particular project, we wanted to go with more natural options for insulation, but went with the SIPs for kind of a, a myriad of reasons. Um, and we can talk about that maybe at another call, but uh, I think we found some other solutions that came out of that. So then um, looking at everything that goes down the list from there, from a cross laminated timber structural wall panel with wood fiberboard uh, down to, you know, two by stud framing with cellulose insulation, uh, or if we went all the way into straw bale, we really like trying to use, really like using projects such that we can use um, a wood frame wall, the straw bale infill, or um, two by stud framing with hempcrete, a mixture of hemp and lime, and then even straw panels. We're very excited about the potential of prefabricating um, straw back into conventional construction. We've got friends in the call that are working on it and we think it's a really exciting future for um, bringing straw back into conventional construction and doing it in a way that um, takes away some of the concerns that, that people might have about straw, but really it is the most carbon neutral, the most sustainable, the most available resource we have out there for building. And um, there's some great, great uh, futures in that. For this particular project, this is where we started to land on a cross laminated timber structure with wood fiberboard um, insulation on the outside. And um, CLT is not super common yet in Montana, Idaho, or Wyoming. Uh, it's definitely gaining steam um, on the West Coast, the East Coast, in urban centers. We have a, a CLT plant up in Columbia Falls, Montana, it's named Smart Lamb. Um, and we've been working with them to think about how could we have them fabricate and deliver a floor, roof, and wall package and help us shrink the construction window, give us this really lovely finished wood interior for this, uh, this building, um, and also help contribute to the carbon neutral goals that we have. 
there, and just for your reference, there are a few different kinds of what we're talking about here when we talk about CLT. Um, when CLT is compared to uh, other systems that you make very large buildings with, when you compare it to steel and concrete, it is um, absolutely a more sustainable option. And uh, it is great uh, in, a, in a fire, it's great in an earthquake. Uh, it is pretty rigid and stiff, but uh, I've been really excited to hear about different entities that have been exploring it, including the military. Um, and from what I've read, they've been really trying hard to burn it down and blow it up and w without success. So um, if you get into any kind of mass timber education, Somebody will usually ask about, you know, what do we know about mass timber buildings that have burned down? And the answer is kind of a shrug because it's a pretty new system and we haven't had one burned down yet. So they tend to char and then those sections can be replaced. But we have parallel strand lumber came around first and then there was uh, not used that much, but there is nail laminated timber. Blue laminated timber is, is very common in the building industry. And then we got into cross laminated timber where we get a full structural panel. And you know the, the life cycle for this is um, one that can be repeated. I think for, for us as kind of looking in a hawkish way at these systems, um, given that it is very a heavy burden on the wood products industry, that once the building ends the end of its you know, useful life, I think it comes into question what happens to that building. If the building is, is actually uh, deconstructed and repurposed, that's great. Um, if, for, if it could be you know, somehow uh, disposed of without being burnt, then I think that's a little bit better. But I think everyone should understand that when we talk about the carbon footprint of a building, that none of these buildings have really met the end of their life cycle yet. And so we just have to be aware of what our numbers mean and what they can actually ensure. The next system component that we chose was uh, wood fiber insulation. And uh, hopefully soon, there, I know there's a couple of distributors that are hoping to be making this stuff in the States and in North and Western Canada uh, this year. But um, wood fiber insulation uh, is a great carbon sink. We can use a bunch of our waste products to make it. Um, it goes in pretty easily and um, is very lightweight and it's self-supporting structurally. So we're able to uh, um, lay it up with very few fasteners, which realize a metal fastener from outside to inside through 12 inches of insulation can really be a thermal bridge. So we even had to model what type of uh, impact do our fasteners have if we need them all over the wall assembly. Um, we waterproof it, then we have um, our structure for our rain screen siding, and then we can put siding out on the side of those furring strips. And if we have time for it, we'll go through um, a little bit of the wall detail if people are actually interested. But the wood fiber insulation is one that we've used now on a couple of renovations in Bozeman. Um, you can source it locally. It's not that hard to find. Uh, it doesn't make your fingers itch. Uh, our guys seem to really like looking or like working with it and it cuts easily. So it's a product that I hope we see more typically um, in the Mountain West for sure. You get about, I think it was like 3.7 R per inch um, for the different kinds of wood fiber insulation of which Gutex is one of the brand names. Uh, okay. So then the other kind of huge factor for path path certification is the quality of the window. Um, our windows for this project are from Intersign. Um, I should have gotten their logo on this sheet, but um, these are Intersign window sections. And it's a fully broken window thermally and a triple pane. And what this means is that, you know, we should expect to stand next to this window on a, you know, negative temperature day and feel like we are not sitting next to a cold window. It should feel warm on the inside. The thermal break is pretty critical for this performance. There's several other factors that go into a, a, a window that can perform in Climate Zone 7 that I won't bore you with today, but um, the windows are really the most challenging part, I think, of passive house design, especially where we are because our market is yet pretty small. If we're in climate zone five, like Denver and Salt Lake, the market gets much bigger for what options can serve there. And they've got some great window options in those, in those climate zones. So I'm gonna zoom in on the table here in a minute, um, but this is what our early schematic model would look like for this project in order to look at it and say, what exactly are the demands? Where exactly are the windows and the openings? Where are our thermal breaks? Um, what kind of, you know, any kind of other shading on the building we might get? So the model is very rudimentary, but it's able to read it in a way that gives us a good output and tells us some really important information um, about 
you know, the, all of the solar heat gains. And like, you, could, you could adjust windows around the volume and say you made, you know, the, you made a window on the north side smaller and enlarged the window on the south side and rerun the analysis and it'll show you exactly how your solar heat gains changed. But also how maybe your transition heat losses might have gained as well. So the more that you, you know, grow your window area around your envelope, there's a trade-off there for the transition value of what you lose through the windows. Um, and generally speaking, large fixed panes of glass perform actually really well. So even though it might be intuitive to think that, you know, when our, because here our views are to the north of the Tetons, that that might be a deal breaker for a passive home, it turns out that it's possible, especially when we get these beautiful windows in there. Um, here's the view. We're going to move over to the model here in just a second. So this, this building is an ARU um, rectangle of a space on the second floor, and then the lower floor is all support, shop, workshop space, studio space for the owner. Um, we have what you're looking at here is the north side that looks out to the, the mountains, out to Grand Teton, and to the east is uh, the main existing house. And then to the west is, is more openness and um, space to kind of spill out down below under the deck. Uh, this is a view to our western side. We've got a bit of a roof deck situation happening up there as well as a, a planted green roof over the shop area. This section is kind of expressing how the space wants to be used. Um, the, the owner has, you know, lots of uh, activities and there's recreational equipment and space to, you know, gather with their friends and work on bikes, store kayaks, backpacking gear, skis, campers, that kind of thing. Our, um, we're planning for uh, Tesla solar batteries on the wall for storage from the solar array as well as um, for future cars. And the space in between these two, uh, we've been calling it the canyon, gets us our entry into the ARU space, which is a, a one private bedroom and bath, one bunk room and a shared bath, and then a gathering space in the center that leads out to the deck. When you get inside, we have these big lift and slide eight by 10 doors, a big corner window that was a, you know, an engineering challenge, but was really fun to figure out. Um, and the whole idea that this building would kind of raise you up into the trees and feel more like a tree house and take in the advantage of the views that are pretty spectacular there um, and just kind of allow you to recede into that interior and let your focus be outside. So um, we put this slide in mostly to remind ourselves that now we should probably go over to the other model. <laughs> Cause I don't think anyone actually really wants to go through this detail. Maybe you guys do. We'd be happy to share um, sort of what system works further with anyone who wants to go into that level of detail. Uh, but we wanted to keep the presentation more general and thought maybe now we could um, maybe fly around our computer model a little bit to get um, more of a feeling for the, the look of the exterior of the building too. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And Lindsay Love is going to take over. Okay, can everybody see that on screen? So I'm thinking, Lindsay, we should maybe uh, we can do a little fly around, but then let's. Uh, pull up maybe our wall sections and we can walk through like those uh, like what the pieces are because the system here I think is pretty unique this is the first it's the first DLT project that Teton County has reviewed and permitted um, and I, I believe next week we're breaking ground uh, fingers crossed um, and then uh, the wood fiber insulation and all the other sort of foam free assemblies are something that are somewhat new to our building community um, in the area Just doing a little screen management here. This white building is an existing building on the site. Um, and I can turn the trees off. So they're a little less distracting. 
That's fine. All right. I do a quick zoom around and then I can do a quick walk through. We, um, we have been uh, calibrating the amount of solar panels that would be needed for a net zero project. And so that's what you can see up here. Okay. Walk through. Sorry. We don't have the Teton in the model, but it's pretty <laughs> epic. Lindsay, do you want to talk a little bit about the com the design concept for this and the treehouse? Concept? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. Um, you know, the 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 ARU, and I'm, I'm stumbling on that word a little bit because we call it an ADU uh, in both of them. I switch between it's like two different languages between the two communities. But um, the, the idea that we could have a space for gathering, for guests, uh, there's a, a big family that enjoys this property and having a place for spillover of friends, but then also having like a really great dedicated space for, um, for working out there different recreational activities. So they're big uh, mountain bikers and um, river rafting and all the things that I guess, why one would choose to live in Jackson. You want to have a space that uh, supports all of that. Yeah. There's a small work and media space downstairs. And that's what this room is that that's kind of walled off there. And then a workbench area, a dog wash, you know, um, direct access outside. So uh, the, the idea just being that like, this could be a space where people can spill over from the main house. We're working on a renovation of their main house right now but the tree house came first and we've been kind of affectionately referring it, referring to it as the tree house, which is, you know, kind of funny given um, its size and everything else. But when we get up, the, the, the site is really surrounded by a lot of natural aspens and the creek flows right around um, the site where the building is. So the landscaping concept too is to really ground ourselves in, you know, natural grasses and stones, placing some gabion walls here in the landscape to help delineate pathways and help to lead you out to where the communal gathering space is outside by the fire pit at the main house, um, provide for privacy at each spot, but really encourage, you know, connection between both the main house and the ARU. Um, and then we have little sun decks and things and places to get outside. But what was really the, the challenge of this project yeah, I think there our wall section three is a great one to review. Um, and I don't know how far you can zoom in on that lens. But the CLT is, uh, you know, available in, in several different plies. You can uh, specify it in from three ply, I think, all the way up to nine ply. We've got a mix of three, five, seven, and I don't know. What, I think we have seven. Aquani, you might check me on that if we have a nine ply in here somewhere in the mix. We're working through the shops right now with, with Smart Lamb and, um, and Red Belt. Um, so then you'll see the, the CLT is on the inside. And what that means is, you know, you're going to get the finish of interior landscape wood on all of your surfaces. Um, it's an aesthetic that I think we really appreciate, but we understand it can be very minimalist and maybe is not for everybody. There's interesting challenges there where think about like, how do you do a light switch? How do you hang a light fixture? Where do your ventilation diffusers go? How do we plug in a lamp? So we had to think forward through all of those solutions and come up with exactly how we would do it. And then the nice thing too about the CLT is that there is a certain air tightness to it in its perpendicular direction. So perpendicular to the strands of the wood and with the glue laminations, in and of itself has an air, is an air barrier. 
Um, so when we use it in a wall system, um, we can treat it that way as long as we cover up basically the cut end when we use it in a floor. Uh, but it means the entire structure then needs to get wrapped continuously with insulation, which gets, you know, challenging and fussy when we get to be uh, around large lift and slide doors and really large window frames. But that's a good nearly 13 inches of uh, two layers of Gutex multi-therm wood fiber insulation. So they're kind of going to go on like, like big bricks on the outside of the CLT. And then you have to waterproof and air barrier, vapor barrier over the outside of that. And then you can put down furring strips and a siding material so that you've got good drainage and airflow to the outside of your envelope. But all of this is gained at creating um, a structure that can be exposed to the inside. Uh, and then we can keep it airtight and waterproof and very resilient, um, even though we've got really large openings and panes of glass everywhere. Yeah, so there's some really particular fussiness you can imagine with like what's supporting that installation once you hit, you know, the top of your CLT connection. And we've needed to work through that with our engineers and they, they've worked really closely with us to think through, you know, all the different options of how we support these products. And that kind of relates back to what we talked about when I talked about earlier, related to communication, um, being willing to, to educate our team, educate each other, maybe not take the first answer that we get and push it a little farther and say, are you sure what else are others doing around, you know, the country or what are, how are others solving these, these problems? Could we consider that here? And, you know, applying a bit of pressure can help us say, well, actually, yeah, we could do that. We could make it work in this way. And along the entire um, process, also uh, working with our contractor, that make sure that he's on board. So our contractor this has been amazing and you know we've had many multi hour meetings where we've just sat down and talked through the sequence of all these things. Um, and that I think is a requirement for any passive project. You have to be ready to sit down and talk through that and take feedback and changes or or educate and sort of confirm that you know the outcome can be met. Um, and I guess the last thing I would mention as we talk through some of these constructability things, and I think we should move to questions, is that one of the reasons why we're involved in that builder training and why we've been in part of this webinar uh, is because we realized about three years ago that we really needed to educate our own workforce if we wanted to get passive projects built in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. Um, we have really, really great contractors um, in our building culture here, very smart people, and, you know, just like I was an architect who thought I was doing sustainable design until I found Passive House. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And if you, you have to be humble enough, I think, to take a step back and decide if there's something you might want to learn more about. And then you can use it to whatever, however the extent you want to. We don't force all of our clients to do passive projects, um, but we do try to make all of our projects better through what we know. And so in, in bringing the builder training to Bozeman two years ago and then building this, uh, bringing the builder training to Jackson and Teton, uh, Valley, Idaho, um, a couple weeks ago, we were able to bring along the contractors that we want to work with. And now that they've got their head in it, they can go, sure, I can estimate that. Sure, I can schedule that. Sure, I can find that product. And it makes the whole process so much more enjoyable for everybody. Um, so giving our contractors the same education that we as architects took, uh, I thought, or we decided was, you know, basically one of the biggest barriers to getting passive projects built. And now being on the other side of that, um, we have a great pool of folks we can go to when we have a new project lead and a new client that we want to match up with a builder. Um, we have a lot of great questions and comments that are coming up, um, but I, I thought it might be helpful or just interesting to kind of touch on the general par values that we're using for Passive House in this climate. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm zoomed in here to just share that a lot of our walls, we're in the realm of R50 um, for walls and then even higher for roofs. Got a R80 roof, R60 roof. Um, just to get you an idea of the um, insulation improvements. Um, typically, fortunately, the insulation is one of the less expensive components of a building, so increasing that is usually not that 
um, cost prohibitive. Um, the wood fiber board insulation is a little bit more. It's kind of relatively comparable to blue board. Um, but when you're talking about, say, cellulose or some or fiberglass, it's, it's like pennies on the dollar compared to other components of the building. Mm -hmm. So should I switch to questions now? Is that, are we there? Yeah, yeah, totally, we could do that. All right, so it looks like the first question is from Stefan. Sorry, Stefan, I'm probably saying this wrong, Mitrovich. Have you looked at a SIP panel with a dense pack cellulose, cellul dense pack cellulose fill, such as Phoenix House? Um, Lindsay, you want to answer that or do you want to? Yeah, yeah absolutely. We've, uh, we've known uh, and been aware of Phoenix House for a couple of years now. They've got a really interesting system. There's um, other companies such as EcoCore out in Maine, um, Be Public down in New Mexico, um, and a few others that are uh, working on creating a prefabricated, uh, foam-free, passive certified wall panel. Uh, it's a mouthful. Uh, but I, and I think it's fantastic. I think it is where this whole industry needs to go. There's um, certain projects, I think, that are, that are particular to being site-built. There's reasons to site-build, um, and that's when a double-sided wall frame is great. But prefabrication, if we have the quality control one can achieve with the air sealing details, potentially also the window installation, um, has a very you know, exciting future, and I think we're going to see more of it. I, I, I hope to use more of those projects or those products in our projects in the future. Um, Toby Groney asked, what's the unit of measure at the bottom of the life cycle chart? Lindsay, if you want to share, we could go back to that. It seems like folks want to. We should have included that in it, and I can tell you that the numbers percent. Yeah. I wonder if you could just pull up that info that you had, Lindsay, and share kind of what the overall unit size is. Um, the, the, the carbon print and the L, the life carbon life, life cycle assessment, um, I'll tell you is it's, it's challenging because I think uh, the more you get into it, the more you realize even some of the placeholder units that you're getting from industry leaders or different manufacturers, you have to also look into how their data is sourced and where does it come from um, and how is it collected and tabulated. And it can be, it can be a real rabbit hole. Um, and so we've done our best to use it in sort of, you know, relative means. So the unit of measure is kilograms of CO2 equivalent. So um, it's basically kilograms of carbon dioxide that are emitted over the life cycle of a product. So we can go into that in more depth if people want to. I'm going to save that for maybe uh, the end of the conversation. And if we go over time or we get done with all the questions, we can go a little further into the weeds with that. Um, okay, someone asked, Giorgio Mahood asked, typical emissity value and e-value of these windows. Um, we use U-values typically, and I need to thank Kluani for filling me in. I'm terrible at remembering numbers, but um, she is not, and she says they are approximately 0.1, U0.10. So they are much less than, even in like a lot of the higher performing homes that we're using around here that do have budgets, we're using windows with U values in the 0.2 to three range. So these are just that much better. Um, Gabion walls. Donna Riley would like to know a little bit about Gabion walls. Uh, sure. So um, a Gabion wall, uh, I, I mean, I first studied them. I've, I saw them being used actually in disaster relief zones where you could build a metal cage, fill it with debris, make a wall. Um, and I think they can be done really beautifully depending on what you stack inside the wire cage, the, the, the gauge of the cage itself and sort of what you're, you know, what kind of a scale you're using for the form, the monolithic form you're trying to create. Um, and 
uh, I've seen some really fancy ones up in Canada, I guess, where they were very, very much an OCD person was like lining up those rocks in there. I thought that was really great. Uh, so I think for us, there's um, some existing river rock on the property that will, that needs to be repurposed. Um, and we'll see what we get from our excavation, but our hope was to repurpose some of the existing materials on the site as a way to help retain the landscape and then further embed the building um, in the ground. Right. And um, it seems like on a, like just sharing of the details, and I'll just let you guys know that we're more than happy to share those with colleagues. We, um, the, my first pass off tour I took in Chicago, the, when architect just took his drawing set and he put it out on a table and he was like, have at it, have at it everybody, just go look at it. And so I really appreciated the transparency and willingness to share information from my other colleagues and I'm happy to help other folks through some of these uh, really serious details that we've worked our way through. Sorry, I missed that comment. And I, I actually do want to take just one moment to look at how our, these details are not final, they're not perfect. But one thing that we've begun to do at Love Shack um, to improve communication with our with builders is identify all the membranes and what um, the exact location of the membrane and identifying what it is. Uh, they can be hard to keep track of. There's so many um, very thin and seemingly um, not that critical pieces, components to high performance buildings, but um, the more we can identify them, call them out and help our builders understand the differences between them, the better. Um, Brian Top asks, is expansion and contraction an issue with the CLTs? Do we have enough build buildings to confirm this is not an issue? That's a, that's a great question because I don't think we have enough buildings done for that whole question to be answered. Um, I think that it really comes down to moisture and water management. And if you have, uh, you know, not only the, the quality of the CLT that you source from the beginning and the low moisture content that it needs. I know that they sent me um, some samples and that was one of the first thing I noticed. I was like, okay, so you send an architect a sample and there's expansion in the sample. How am I supposed to feel about that? Um, but I think more that was about that particular small block not having you know, the rest of the integrity of the diaphragm that it would have. So I think that once you properly, like, and you close it inside your thermal envelope, you're also regulating the temperature that that panel is gonna exist at. So I think in passive house applications, we're in a much better position for that to not be so much of an issue. If we were in a non-passive house, non-thermally broken situation where maybe there was questionable water management, I think that that absolutely could be something that could be uh, discovered later on. Enrico, Enrico, I don't know how to say your last name, Mulari says, I think you have more trained pH builders per capita than anywhere else in the US. Enrico was one of the pre presenters on our webinar series and he was the trainer at the um, training that we hosted recently. So that's exciting. And I think speaks to the comment that I remember Katie Holbacher making in her original presentation about how our carbon emissions are much higher than anywhere else in the US per capita. Hopefully we're, we're moving the needle a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Caroline Groth asks, any recommended contractors building passive houses in Bozeman? I think maybe best to follow that up via email. Yeah, absolutely. We've got um, some great contractors in Bozeman. Uh, we had a few people come up from out of state for our Bozeman training two years ago. Um, a good turnout at our uh, Jackson training um, and if you want to send us an email, we'll provide you with a list of those folks. But Jacob, hi Jacob. Um, where is the CLT being sourced from? Lindsay, you want to talk you know about that? Yeah, okay. The plant is in, oh, I'm forgetting the town. It's just in Montana. Though. Columbia. Columbia Falls, right. The name is Smartland, and their distributor is Red Built. And um, that transaction, I think that just occurred, but I think you can still find them under Smart Smartland North America. Yes. Thanks, Kulani, you answered that too. Um, all right. 
Rain Wardwell. I'm not sure how to answer that question, but he says collect. <laughs> well, one of my favorite panelized uh, fabricators, really cool dudes up in British Columbia, uh, they are collective history. And um, they've been working with the public, the company that I mentioned doing prefabricated work in New Mexico. And we sure hope to team up on a project in Montana real soon. Um, there's some advantages to working with folks up in Canada, not, not necessarily just that it's really fun to visit Canada um, and they're really polite, nice people, but that um, there's an advan advantageous exchange rate for some of the materials and services. Um, and, you know, Canada has been, I guess, I would say progressing faster than the U.S. when it comes to passive house awareness and contractors and projects, and it's especially, you know, doing this in cold climates. These guys know how to do it. Ray, and if there's something in addition that you want to ask out loud about that question, feel free to. <laughs> um, Susan Klinker asks, what is the wood siding product that you chose? And Susan, I actually have a feeling I know where you're coming from with this question. I just talked to Ryan recently. Um, Susan is a client of ours and she is developing a wood, sorry, a straw panel product um, and sort of prototype in Salt Lake City. We used Gutex on this project. Um, I know I've got a sample of sauna climate here in my office and they're, they're slightly different. I know Gutex does have a product that can be used to directly plaster onto, but it's only for interiors. Um, but let me know if you want more information about that. Happy to talk more. Um, Brian Rosenberger asks, to what extent are these goals achievable when there are real budget constraints, i.e. more constraints than you'd be dealing with for clients in Jackson, Wilson, and Bozeman? Well, I mean, I think one of the most common questions we answer is, well, how much extra to make it passive house? Um, and I guess, you know, the that's always a challenging question to answer because once we're answering it in that way, we're not thinking about it in the way that it best serves us. And so that's where we come to it's not appropriate for every project. Um, it can be done uh, for a typical market rate housing build cost. It just means that there has to be some priorities made in the design to, to make sure that you hit that goal. So for example, our Bozeman Passive House is a very simple compact volume. It's basically a two-story rectangle with a gable roof, a couple of negative spaces hogged out, some big windows, but the volume itself is quite simple. And that was, that was in the idea of minimizing our thermal bridges, minimizing our corners, minimizing our junctions that we would have to detail and have special attention and paid toward. Um, and that project uh, was built for, if you include the garage, which actually, no, I'll take the garage out. If you don't include the garage and the garage is quite large um, and it was not built to passive house envelope standards, it's just typical construction. The house itself came in at about 260 per square foot. And then when you add the garage in for the total build, we got down closer to $200 a square foot. Um, I think the, you know, everything's going up right now. So I think it's really challenging to talk about square foot prices because it's a moving target. But I would challenge almost any custom home builder in the area to build um, a new home in that price point. Um, unless really what we're after is, you know, um, the most, the most affordable build that can be built is likely not a passive house. And I think when we get into that conversation, we always like to remind people to put a value on things that are perhaps more intangible during the building process. So, you know, we don't necessarily calculate for indoor air quality, for thermal comfort, for when your boiler and furnace breaks down and you got to replace it in the middle of a winter storm, for dealing with, you know, waterproofing issues and repair of systems and finishes after five or 10 years. And when we really start to, you know, capitalize on all the assets that we actually have, and we think about the cost to live in a building, then, you know, passive house can make the argument, oh, it is the cheapest way to build. So there's some funny arguments that go on around cost and passive house, but um, if it really depends on what type of building you want to do and the challenge right now is every type of building in the West is expensive. And unless you're able to invest a lot of your own sweat equity in the process and the actual construction, it's really hard to get around some of those hard costs. Yeah, Lindsay, do you have anything to add to that? Um, 
No, that was very well said. I think it's a very hard conversation. Um, I, I would just add that our financing structure in this country is set up to very much constrain the conversation around building to cost per square foot. And, and we don't think about resale value and how the value down the road pays itself back or um, energy savings. And we're starting to see that, that change. Um, but I think until the actual structure of the financing system changes and bankers actually are able to see the value, I don't think we're gonna um, see the, the costs be like completely equal. Um, Susan, great question. How do you calculate the CO2 related to transport of Gutex products coming from Germany? What I have heard is that shipping from Europe, as long as you are going to a coast, it's very, very minimal. Um, boats and trains are extremely efficient in their use of emission, in their use of fossil fuels. And so once you're coming into the middle of the country, that's where the emissions increase. And so it kind of sucks. We're stuck in the Rocky Mountains. So there's some carbon in that. But what I've seen and what I've heard from manufacturers who are doing the LCA studies on their own products is that there's some emissions there, but it is, it's minuscule compared to what the product stores. So it's, it's not a reason not to use it. Um, Toby asks, have you been able to develop cost comparisons between SIPs versus CLT? We have not yet. But we, we do know that the, the CLT is, is more expensive. And I think once you get into, it depends on um, the value of CLT, I think is when we get into volume. So if we have a large scale project, um, a multifamily building, a hotel or a dorm, that's when CLT starts to become cost competitive. Uh, but, because it does, it does go up very fast. But right now, I think it's very clear that on a smaller project like this, CLT is not um, going to be less expensive than SIPs. Uh, Bonnie asks, hi Bonnie, um, have you heard how well these panels age? Can they delaminate or discolor? So, I think, again, it comes down to the, the climate they're being installed in, how they're being installed. Most CLT projects are not passive house projects. So we've got an extra, basically, winter coat around the, the CLT structure for, the, for its whole lifespan. Um, when, so when it comes to, like, the interior wear and care, you know, I, I think we're definitely looking out to how we're going to finish the floor because we are going to leave it alone. We're not going to top it with everything. In the bathrooms, we'll lay tile, but in the common spaces, you'll have that wood floor with I'm sure some soft goods, but um, so far, uh, you know, since the product's only been around for about 20 years, it's shown it's, it's aged very well. Um, but I, you realize that if it starts to, you know, in any way delaminate or fade, you could actually, like the delamination are thick enough, you could go in and refinish it. But I think that would be an interesting thing for people to do, but we of course haven't seen it yet. Um. Brain word well, you must be with Collective Carpentry, so. Collective Carpentry. He's just playing with you. <laughs> um, Paul Cote, I hope I'm saying that wrong. Hi, Paul. Are there no limits to our values? When is enough enough? Um, there is, I think there is certainly, on every project, it changes, but there, there could be a limit to how much insulation pays itself back over time. And I think that's a conversation that EMU at, uh, pass at um, sorry, Enrico at EMU would answer very well. Um, the, I just took the passive house training course and they have, I've seen numbers. It's very clear that building this way pays itself off in a very reasonable amount of time. It, there's a little added cost up front, but um, this, it works out economically in an owner's benefit. Um, 
the other component to that is the carbon, embodied carbon of insulation. And I would just add that because we are building these buildings that are so high performing, so insulative, the embodied carbon of the insulation is extra critical. If we have graphics that show this, but we know that if you are building to this level with say spray foam, which is kind of the highest embodied carbon, um, it's going to take the planet like over a hundred years to pay that back in terms of uh, harm to the climate. So um, we just really try to limit the, if we're using this much insulation, it's got to be plant-based and it's got to be low carbon, low carbon story. Uh, can I make a comment there? Sure. You know, in, in my experience as a builder, I, I've more or less found that once you can get into the mid 30s without any thermal bridging that you have for most practical reasons, stopped heat loss. And I've never seen any data to back that up or defy that. But when I see you getting our values in the 50s and 60s, I start to wonder, are we using our resources widely or just going a bit overboard on that? And I'd be interested if there's any sort of research available or statistics that show us where, where should we ideally be, be hitting? Yeah, I think I would be happy to follow that up with you in a email or in person conversation. Um, again, I think it's different for every project and, you know, maybe someday in our region, in our climate zone seven, there will be a standard that says, this is where you get the most bang for your buck. This is where you're not wasting resources. I think this is all new enough that we're, we just don't have that data fully yet. Um, Katie Dahlgren from Beyond Efficiency, hi. Can you also comment on the HVAC and DHW systems, direct hot water or domestic hot water, sorry. We did not go through that. Uh, HVAC is mini split and hot water is a heat pump. And Kulani, do you want to chime in and add to that about the ventilation system? Probably muted. Sorry, yeah, what was the question? Uh, comment on the HVAC, domestic hot water, and then uh, ventilation systems. Oh, okay. So we're using a fan coil unit um, and, um, and then supplemental with coke heaters around the building. For the mini split, in addition to the mini split. Mm -hmm. yes. In addition, yeah. Okay. It's because the temperatures in Jackson, uh, when they get down into our 30 belows, uh, the co-heaters need to supplement for heat. Right. And because this is CLT, we're not doing the ducted system. Therefore, the co-heaters instead of the uh, fan coil. Katie, you know more about that stuff than we do. Um, and the ventilation system, the HRV, ERV, I believe is a Zender, but I would default to Kulani. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks for the nice comment, Katie. Um, would your client be open to an open house? We would sure ask him. Yeah, actually, um, they're, the client is very interested in allowing us to use this as a demonstration project. So we're hoping to not only document a lot of the construction project um, itself, especially the day that the CLT panels fly, right? but to invite colleagues um, and friends and you know, people to come by the project at particular times. So especially when we get closer to construction completion, when the systems are really on best display, we do hope to do an in-person tour um, of the project. As long as safety allows. Was that Fife asked what computer program we're using to model our houses? We happen to use ARCHICAD, but we're not proponents of it. Um, we like it, but there's other good programs out there. Um, it's sort of a 
Mac-based Revit, and then uh, we're using a Design PH plugin for SketchUp to do that really early sketchy uh, energy modeling on projects. So, and that's a pre that's a pretty new and useful tool, so that you don't get too committed to a particular form or layout or program before you know how it's going to perform in, in a in the PHPP in the Passive House planning package that will get you certified. Um, it is, it's five after one, so we've actually gone over. If folks want to stay on and talk a little bit more about any of this, we'll, we're happy to stay here till 1.15 or so. Um, Katie Dahlgren just wanted to mention back to Paul uh, that it really depends on the project massing, solar gain or lack of, location, type of building and occupancy, how you're defining enough, that's kind of a subjective term vague. Um, and if you want to compare ROI to solar PV payback over time, um, so many things, so many factors to consider. Okay. Yeah. A lot of issues there. Um, yeah. A lot of issues there. Thank you. Well, thanks to everybody for joining us. If you need to sign off, um, Please do. Leah, I see you have asked about um, CEUs and you should just contact Anna Foster at AI Idaho. She is taking care of that for folks. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us today. We'll um, be putting a recording of the webinar up on our YouTube channel so that you can look at it later if you want to or share it with a friend. Um, we hope to be doing more of these things through Passive House Rocky Mountains and the North American Passive House Network. They'll be doing a month or maybe even a bi-monthly webinar call where we'll just be sharing information. Uh, I think Passive House Rocky Mountains is going to host the first one coming up in August. So um, if you uh, sign up for our newsletter, you should get information about that. Um, and more than anything, we just want to be connected with the rest of the folks that are curious about this, uh, curious about low carbon, high performance building where we are, um, so we can continue to connect, us, uh, connect with our colleagues. Um, contractors, clients, folks out there that are interested, and just prove that this is possible out there where we're all trying to build. Um, and we hope to be able to demonstrate that to all of you in person soon. Just to keep going with questions, um, Toby asked, do we think it's sufficient to use carbon offsetting as a standalone guiding metric? If these hybrid structures utilize three or four times as much structural wood product, is carbon offset analysis alone really sufficient to understand the ultimate demand of a building? Can you clarify, Toby, what you mean by the demand of a building? Yes, I, oh, um, I, I posed this question to you guys in a different fashion during, that, during the um, course a uh, month back. And I know one of you answered uh, me with a, a document that I honestly haven't gotten to um, review yet, but you know, it's kind of, in my mind, I can't help but consider other, um, other um, demands um, that are required by each different material type while, you know, so if we're focused only on carbon offsetting, well, what about, you know, like harvesting of wood product, you know, the growth and harvesting of wood products is, um, really demanding in other ways, you know, leading to like, you know, topsoil loss and um, streamside, you know, you know, destruction of waterways and such. So for, I, I often find myself thinking, are we, are we substituting, are we trading evils, kind of? Um, it's it's hard to know how to measure that to enter in a answer that in a quantitative way, I guess, but. Um, I'm curious to talk to you guys more about um, what analysis you've seen and um, along those lines that are a little, maybe a little bit harder to measure. Well, I, I think that graph that we shared earlier is, is sort of our best analysis of how they compare. And so we know that a site built wood framed, typically wood framed stud wall with cellulose insulation or wood fiber insulation has a lower carbon impact than a CLT structure. I think where the CLT really starts to prove itself is when you compare it to steel buildings and heavily used, you know, if we have a large amount of concrete in a building and the CLT could do the same job. That's where I think it's the, it's a low carbon choice. So in our project, we chose the CLT for some other reasons. 
And then we just did the calculus to figure out exactly what, what is the cost of that choice and got to a point where we felt okay about it. Um, but again, like, I think it's a good um, reminder that these projects are, you know, they're high reaching goals, but I think reading, they're never going to be an ideal or a perfect depending upon what's the, what's the standard that we're applying it to. Right. So, and when it comes to CLT, I think, I think that we're still learning whether or not it's a totally sustainable enterprise. Um, I think what is easy for the wood products industry to really be cheerleading about is that it can replace a lot of our steel and concrete and our oil our, our ground extracting construction processes. Mm -hmm. I really do think it's, it's beneficial there, but if you're comparing it to like, you know, I don't think we're going to see single family homes built out of CLT uh, anytime soon, necessarily. I would just add to that, um, that the, the numbers that we have are only as good as the data that's published. And um, that is improving. There's a lot of pressure within the industry to improve those things right now. There's organizations who are really raising awareness around it like the Carbon Leadership Forum and Passive House as well is starting to um, sort of require industries to be transparent about their embodied carbon impacts. And the more that we ask and inquire for that data to be shared, the faster it will be shared and the faster we can do our job better. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, one last little bit of information. We're work in our Wilson project that we've shared with you guys. We're working with Steve Landis of Select Builders. Um, and he's an awesome. I wish he was on the call today. Andrew Mitchell yeah. just let us, just reminded us, we knew this, but I have forgotten, that the new PHPP, which is the very robust um, energy modeling spreadsheet for passive house design, uh, there is a carbon plugin that you can incorporate into your model to determine the carbon load. All right. Well, thanks everybody so much for joining us. Thanks for yeah, having thanks for all Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Hope to continue the conversation in other ways in the future. Take care and stay in touch. Thanks everybody. Bye.